Wisconsin Longitudinal Study is a sample of one in three Wisconsin high school graduates from the class of 1957. Um, they've been interviewed since 1957, or they've been impaneled since 1957, um, and the sample has grown over time to include a selected sibling for um, each relevant graduate, um, and we've also interviewed their spouses and asked lots of questions about their children and their parents as well. So in essence, it's over time become a family-based sample. The central strength of the study is that it is a longitudinal panel that's covered a single cohort over nearly 50 years. Uh, another important strength is the fact that we um, have been interviewing the siblings of the graduates for, in essence, over 20 years. So we can look at, uh, in essence, um, uh, sibling-based designs, family samples. Um, the breadth of the study so in the early part, or in the early years of the study, we were focused mostly on uh, educational attainment, occupational attainment, family. As the study has aged, um, the kinds of things that we've asked them are relevant to their life course perspective. So now we're focusing heavily on health, um, psychological well-being, retirement, um, retirement economic well-being. Well, there's a there's sort of a range of uh, I think different different relevant findings. Oh, one new area that we've begun to explore is the interaction between um, bi biological and, and and social factors. So um, while we collect a lot of relevant health data on our sample, um, we've also been able to collect um, genetic data. So we can look at how, for example, gene environments interact to affect people's. Uh, health to, and especially to affect things like their psychological well-being in, in, in late life. Um, we've been able to look at how uh, people's educational experiences, including um, their academic performance, has affected health and mortality in late life. Um, so there's a lot of work, for example, looking at the relationship between IQ and mortality. We measured our respondents' IQs when they were in high school, or they were collected by the state of Wisconsin, and um, we were able to demonstrate, or people were able to demonstrate using our data, that it wasn't so much IQ that uh, drove mortality. It was uh, much more strongly linked to people's academic performance, their grades, their rank in high school specifically. There are a couple examples. Um, you know, more broadly, the degree to which we can look at how experiences across people's life course and their work and their family life and their childhood even, how that influences psychological health and economic well-being in late life. A few expe specific examples would include, um, we have uh, a, a lot of questions on people's um, end of life planning. And this is a highly relevant policy debate at the moment. So how well are people preparing in, in terms of things like preparing wills or um, health care proxies? Um, so we've asked a lot of people very specific questions about their planning. Um, and then we've been able to look at, this is uh, Deborah Carr at Rutgers, has been able to look at what predicts people to plan um, for end of life. And everything from um, your marital relationships to your educational attainment seem to be relevant in terms of helping us understand who's planning and who isn't. Aging. Well, that's a good question. I mean, our sample is interesting in part because we're on the sort of uh, cups of the baby boomers. Our sample is just a little bit older. Um, but so, so we sort of, the, our sample sort of falls in between the baby boomers um, and the cohort following, so that, or the old, slightly older cohort. Uh, so it's a transition period. So for example, um, people older than our cohort would have had um, things like defined benefit plans for that comprise their retirement income, a pretty straightforward retirement income stream. In our sample, you're seeing that transition um, that younger cohorts are experienced, where their financial lives are a lot more complicated. Their private savings is a lot more relevant to their retirement planning and retirement income. Um, so things like that.
One of the greatest strengths of the study is the breadth of the data that we've collected. We've collected information on nearly every aspect of these people's lives, so there's always <laughs> room. Um, one area where there has been a lot of work, but where we would like to see a lot more is especially related to con cognition. So precisely because we have measures of cognition when these individuals were in their childhood, um, and we've been continuing to collect cognitive functioning measures as they age, there's a lot of work to be done on helping understand, in essence, how cognition changes as people age, what determines those changes, how things that happen during your schooling experiences, during your work life, um, how other health factors help shape and genetic factors help, help change uh, cognition as people age.